this morning, and uh, this is an amazing book. Um, this is the kind of book that you could read in college-level literature and uh, just find it to be absolutely amazing. Uh, G. Campbell Morgan on the book of Esther says, There's no situation in human life or experience for which a message of God cannot be found through the book. I do not care whether it to be a personal, social, national, or international situation. And about the future, this book has no hesitation. There, or there is much it does not reveal, but the reality of it is insisted upon from beginning to end. And the great fundamental things that we need to know in this preparatory life are all here in this book. Also, Charles Spurgeon comments that the Lord intended by the narrative of Esther's history to set before us a wonderful instance of his providence that when we had viewed it with interest and pleasure, we might praise his name and then go on to acquire the habit of observing his hand in other histories and especially in our own lives. Well does Flavel say that he who observes providence will never be long without a providence to observe. The man who can walk through the world and see no God is set upon inspired authority to be a fool, but the wise man's eyes are in his head, and he sees with an inner sight and discovers God everywhere at work. And so, Father, we do pray right now, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would instruct us. Lord God, help us with the baggage and the obstacles that we have in life this morning to see ourselves in application in the hope that has existed in the book of Esther. And we just pray that in Jesus' name, and everyone said... Amen. And so the book of Esther, we read about it, we started it last week. And we know that it takes place chronologically between Ezra, chapters 6 and 7. And so as the 2 million or so Jews ended up being in the Babylon captivity for how many years? For 70 years, okay, only 50,000 go to Jerusalem, or just less than 50,000, with Zerubbabel, with Joshua, for the temple rebuild, and then for just for revival to rebuild the people, only a few thousand end up going. And so for those that chose to stay in Babylon, to stay comfortable, because God had blessed the Jews in Babylon and had blessed their surroundings, and so for those that stayed there, we have the book of Esther. And we were introduced to uh, Ahasuerus, which is a title like Pharaoh last week. He's the king. And his parents decided to name him Xerxes. They thought that was a good idea. So he's the king there in Persia. He's quite a character. And we talked about some of the um, stories regarding his knowledge. For example, when he, he went to build a bridge and a storm came and the bridge was torn down, he had soldiers go and beat the water because he was upset. So it kind of sounds like a king who could throw a tantrum. I mean, it's hard for us in our Western society to imagine that, but we'll just pretend like we understand what that's like. But he was, he was a little flaky. He uh, was the kind of guy that um, had his soldiers throw shackles into the sea to somehow try to imprison the sea. So he's not dealing with probably a full deck. That's our king, and that's why we need God. And so, uh, kind of a flaky guy, but uh, we learned uh, that he had a queen named... Vashti, which means beautiful. So I don't know if her parents had insight or if they named her that after. I don't know. Who knows? So, but she's the queen. And long story short, um, Xerxes is trying to formulate um, military backing to take on Greece. And so he has parties like they were 1999 and on, like a six-month party. I mean, just party after party. He's trying to impress these guys. He shows them their wealth. And they get drunk, okay? And so at some point, it, we don't know why or how it came about, but the king wants the queen to go and kind of parade herself in front of these drunken guys. She says, no. We don't know why. She could have been pregnant. She could have had dignity. She could have been moral. We don't know. But she ends up uh, getting a separation at the end of Esther chapter 1, and she's still a part of the harem, but she's no longer a part of the kingdom. And I want to break out for you some possibly unknown trivia regarding the book of Esther. Are you ready? It doesn't matter. We're going for it. Okay. Trivia, perhaps unknown. 
the gallows, which I guess could have been, according to Bruce Brown, could have been a pole for impaling. I really hope it wasn't. Uh, the gallows constructed for Haman was 75 feet high, so comparable to a seven-story building today. So if somebody's getting impaled, they're really tall. So secondly, Haman was also an astrologer. And so when he was about to fix the time for the genocide of the Jews, he first cast lots, which are kind of like dice, to ascertain which was the most auspicious day of the week for that purpose. Also, there's a special noisemaker called in Hebrew a ra'ashan. Uh, in Yiddish, it's Gregor, just kind of rolls off the tongue, and uh, it's used to express disdain for Haman. So whenever the festival of Pur Purim occurs, which we'll get to eventually, um, when Haman is mentioned in the book of Esther, everybody hisses, and they break out their Gregors. Um, also, there's a pastry known as an Oznai Haman, which literally means the ears of Haman. Just a fun fact. In Yiddish, it's something I can't pronounce, uh, traditionally eaten on this day. Now, this is the part I like. In pop culture, Scooby-Doo in Arabian Nights depicts Haman as an evil uh, vizier to the sultan in his story segment, uh, Ali Adin. So, but my favorite, though, is Mr. Lunt. Anybody here seen VeggieTales? This morning I looked up, uh, uh, you're his cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah, okay, I don't get out much. So, uh, Mr. Lunt portrayed this biblical fe figure in the 2000 VeggieTales episode, Esther, the girl who became queen. Let that bless you this week. All right, between chapters one and two, uh, there's a three to four year time gap. And Xerxes lock, launches this invasion. Remember in chapter 1, he was feeling pretty proud of himself because they had defeated the Egyptians. But now he's taking on Greece. So I don't know if he was the one that he wanted. Woo, hoo, hoo. But he returns a battered, beaten man, and he returns wifeless. Again, Vashti refused to come to him in the third year of his reign, about 483 B.C., and Esther was made queen in the seventh year of his reign, 479 B.C., 16 to seven, or in chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. And so during the intervening years, Xerxes is off fighting a disastrous war with Greece. Um, he has a humiliating defeat. Uh, he depleted the treasuries of the Persian Empire, and this discredited him in the eyes of his subjects. And what we see, what, we, what you and I see in this life is this digression that happens when we allow sin in our lives. And in chapter 1, we talked about how a king did not express any dignity whatsoever or respect for his queen. And he did so publicly. And sin has a way of catching up with ourselves. And so that's what happened. Thank you, Clyde. And so, uh, in chapter 2, we're going to see that Esther is chosen queen, and uh, we're going to see that the gathering together of a harem for a king, Ahasuerus, occurs, and in verses 1 through 4, a search is made for a replacement for Queen Vashti. So if you'll join me, Esther chapter 2, verse 1, after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done, and would have been uh, decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Shushan the citadel into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. So the historian Herodotus describes the king's life after his military defeat as one of sensual indulgence. Um, and he dallied with some of the wives, that's a nice way to put it, dallied, with some of the wives of his officers, and many think that this was actually a factor in his assassination uh, in his bedroom in 465 B.C., so the gathering of all the beautiful young virgins from throughout the empire, it seems outrageous to our modern thinking. Um, even by Persian standards, this was not the way that a queen was normally chosen. Um, according to Herodotus, Xerxes' father Darius took wives from the noble families of Persia 
And often they came from the family of the king's seven closest advisors. So perhaps one of Mamukins, and that's just an unfortunate name that we're introduced to in chapter one, little baby Mamukin, um, had ulterior motives in having Vashti deposed, uh, probably hoping that uh, her replacement would have been chosen uh, from his family so he could have increased favor with the king. So the plan was to assemble a harem from the most beautiful women of the land uh, to bring them into a harem for the king. One historian thought that uh, at a time there could have been 400 women uh, in this harem. Um, chosen to be the most favored woman to be his queen from that group. It's kind of a Miss uh, Persian Empire contest, but really not. And then the winner is going to be queen instead of Vashti. So uh, verse 4 says, Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. And this thing pleased the king, and he did so. Okay, so this is about four years past that feast that we read about in chapter 1. Um, like Cher, he can't turn back time. So, um, you know, he <laughs> that's bad. So, um, you know, he knew that what happened with Vashti would bring shame uh, upon uh, his kingdom, upon the people. Now, why do you think his advisors don't want to bring Vashti back as queen? Let's just imagine for ourselves that he, God speaks to him or he gets like a noble thought and thinks, yeah, I should bring her back. She was a good queen to me. She made incredible eggs. Her toast was choice. Why would it be bad to bring her back as queen? Shows weakness, okay? What's that? They passed the law. So if she comes back, who's the first people she's gonna act, she's gonna get rid of? Those advisors, right? Because they candor, her, okay? So um, yeah, they're like, yeah, don't bring her back. So, but that was actually normal according to Persian history, this type of you know, how they determined who was gonna be queen. And so um, this thing pleased the king. Uh, Josephus says again that Ahasuerus had a total of 400 women selected. Uh, good for them. So verses 5 through 7, we're going to look at Esther and her family. In Shushan the citadel, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, or Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Kish had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives who had been captured with Jeconiah, king of Judah whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Okay, so Mordecai is the cousin of Esther. He comes to Persia in one of the waves of relocation uh, that the Babylonians imposed in Judah when it conquered that land. Why is Jeconiah's name significant? You guys will be familiar with Gen Jeremiah 22. It's because of, there was a blood curse on Jeconiah. So you remember that king that was put under the curse, uh, Jeremiah 22, 30, uh, thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David. And so um, this curse gets placed on the line, and Satan thought that he accomplished his purpose in doing this, okay? Because he's putting, putting a curse on the line of David. So that would invalidate the messianic line, right? Because Messiah is from the family of Judah, has to come through the line of David, okay? So if you can put a curse on that bloodline, problem solved, Messiah can't rule and reign forever. So in Jeremiah 22, Coniah became the poster child for bringing that to pass. How many here have read the New Testament? Show of hands. Okay, so you know in Matthew chapter 1, you got some genealogy going on. Also in Luke chapter 3, you've got some genealogy going on, right? Okay, so you get this long list. You get to Luke 3, there's another list. Matthew's account goes from Joseph, from the line of David, to Solomon, to Caniah and the curse. It would make that line invalid, but Jesus wasn't born of the seed of a woman. Um... I'm sorry. Jesus wasn't born of the seed of man. <laughs> he was born of the seed of the woman. And so Luke 3's genealogy is the saving grace because it, it's Mary's genealogy, and it goes from David to another son, and that's Nathan. 
okay? And so that way, that bypasses the curse. So apparently, God knows what he's doing. Go figure. Okay, so the seed of the woman uh, has no curse upon the bloodline. Therefore, Messiah is the seed of the woman, as Isaiah spoke of, of the virgin birth. Luke's genealogy is of the biological mother, uh, because one is a uh, patronymic, the family name through the father of the house of David, uh, but again, that birth order. That, so Jack and I gets our attention. Somebody said, because do you ever read through the Bible and you're in a genealogy and you're thinking, I'm going to have to shave by the time I'm done reading this. You know, do I fill out my will? You know, somebody said that every genealogy in the Bible is meant to point us to Jesus. So good thing to keep in mind as you're reading those. Verse 7. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, so they're cousins, uh, and she's orphaned, and we don't know why. For she had neither father nor mother. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. Vashti's just beautiful. So you got a lovely there. Something going on here. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. Some believe that she was 10 to 20 years apart in age from Mordecai. So in verse 8, Esther is taken into the king's harem. So it was... When the king's command and decree were heard, and when many young women were gathered at Shushan the citadel, under the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. So he's in charge of the harem. And again, our culture, we showcase beauty. We showcase youth. And we see so many celebrities that have those things, and yet they end up in alcohol, drug treatment, not happy. If a couple, a celebrity couple, stays together, like what Paul and Joanne, before he passed, I mean, that's a pretty rare thing, right? So, but that's what this world celebrates, and it accentuates the exterior, not so much as the interior. So uh, think about then, those that are going into this harem, there are going to be some women... They have one night with the king, and then that's it, okay? And they, they're never going to see him again, and their hope is to become queen, which obviously would be a powerful position. But again, it was a lonely life. In fact, now it was a comfortable life. You were taken care of, but you end up just being one step up above a slave, okay, in this kind of context. We want to get an idea of what Esther is exposed to because we want to appreciate the hand of God, throughout all this, which is woven. I, I believe Jesus Christ is on every page of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. So um, here we're going to look at Esther and the courts of the king and Esther's favored treatment in the palace. Now, the young woman pleased him, and she obtained his favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. And then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maidservants to the best place in the house of the women. Okay, so why does uh, the keeper of the women, uh, Heger, uh, why does he favor Esther? It's because we see God working behind the scenes. And, and he's doing that all throughout this book. In fact, there are some um, Messianic Jewish teachers that believe that the book of Esther is actually more important than the Pentateuch because it speaks about the future pre preservation of the Jewish people. And, and they see that in the book of Esther. So verses 10 through 11, Esther's going to conceal her Jewish identity. Esther had not revealed her people or family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. Why do you think this was something to hide? Well, what is, what is Satan's attitude towards God's people? He's not a fan. So I don't think we're on, uh, our pictures are on Satan's fridge, unless it's a bullseye kind of a thing. So um, Pharaoh tries to annihilate him, okay? Um, here, Haman tries to annihilate him. In the time of Christ, Herod tries to annihilate him. In our own day, Hitler tries to annihilate him, okay? If the devil can destroy God's people, then God's word is void, and I want to tell you something. There's one city that is never going off the map, and that is Jerusalem. There's one nation that is never going off the, nap, the map, or the nap, and that's Israel, okay? So it's amazing what they've done since May 14th of 1948. Um, they had swampland, 
and people are dying of malaria and other things. And so what they did is they built, they planted trees on the road in, in northern Israel and they're helped to shield the snipers that are firing on them as they're working on the land to convert it from, from swampland. And that's up around the Golan Heights area. And so they're trying to reclaim the land and they come back and they've been constantly persecuted and it didn't even stop when they got into the land. Israeli history is very, very interesting. So what's going on here in Esther is the idea of hiding your family line, hiding your lineage. If she disclosed that she was a Jew, it wouldn't keep her from being dragged into the harem to be a concubine, but it might immediately eliminate her from the chance to be queen. And this is God's plan all along. God knows what he's doing. That's important. And I think, again, we said this last week, but the name of God isn't in Esther. So in a sense, you might say, well, that is invisible. But what we're going to see about Esther and her character and her integrity is that she's able to see the invisible God with invisible problems, okay, in her surroundings. So uh, verse 11, and every day, and you can see this as a father with a daughter, every day Mordecai paced in front of the court of the women's quarters to learn of Esther's welfare and what was happening to her. So his great interest in her shows uh, his love, his concern, uh, and, and she's in a potentially dangerous place. So in verses 12 through 14, we're going to look at the method of preparing and presenting the women before the king. It's going to be established. Verse 12. Each young woman's turn came to go into King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation, according to the regulations for the women, for thus were the days of their preparation apportioned. So six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. So men... If your husband or if your <laughs> if your wife takes a while getting ready, <laughs> that was bad. Um, you know, get used to it. Used in the embalming process, myrrh speaks of what? Death. Okay. Boy, that was a buzzkill, wasn't it? Okay. So it was one of the gifts that were brought to Jesus by the wise men, and it spoke prophetically of the fact that he would die in order to fulfill God's grand plan of redemption. How willing, though, are you and I to die to ourselves in order to live for our king? You know, I mean, I find out. As I'm looking at, the, at this x-ray, this word of God each week, I, I see where I fall short. In fact, the duct tape I put in my Bible, I wanted to be like a mirror because I don't want to forget what my sin looks like. I need to be in tune with that, in contact with that. Another consideration, what does time prove in addition to their beauty why do you think they allotted that amount of time because it's for a very practical reason what's that attitude, attitude? how about whether or not they're pregnant okay because we're talking about a king and a throne and if if that potential queen is already pregnant then there's an heir there and it's not from the king so uh, and we see that in betrothal in the New Testament, we see how a very long time, extended time of betrothal, and, and it had very practical reasoning behind that, okay? So, um, yeah, they're, they're soaking in uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Verse 13. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king, and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's quarters to the king's palace. In the evening she went, and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch, who kept the concubines. And she would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called for her by name. So after a year of preparation, uh, Persia is one of these countries that's actually famous for its aromatic perfumes, uh, and ancient customs for the preparations of brides, including ritualistic baths, uh, plucking of eyebrows, and the painting of hands and feet with henna, as well as facial makeup and applications of a, a beautifying paste uh, all over the body meant to lighten the color of the skin and to remove spots and blemishes. And I have too many jokes in my head right now, so I'll keep going. So the evening that you left, in context here, 
Okay, you leave the house of the maidens, the virgins. Then the next day when you come back, you entered the house of the secondary wives, the concubines, and your status changed. So you go through this year-long process, one night with a king, that, again, that may, be, that may be it, okay, for the rest of your life with him, and now you remain in the secondary house, you're essentially a prisoner, okay? So women at this time in the Persian Empire are really a, a one step above slaves. Keep in mind the caliber of man that God has Esther appeal to. For some of us, we should be very thankful for our marriages today, okay? When your spouse is throwing shackles in the ocean to capture the ocean, there's a problem. That's why we have marriage counseling. Verse 15 through 18, Esther is selected as queen. So now when the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king, she requested nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women advised, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. So she requests nothing but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, uh, the custodian of the women advised. So uh, we see that she has humble wisdom, okay? And that's shown in the way that she allowed the custodian of the women to assist her preparations. It also says that she obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. Um, this is because of both of her godliness and beauty. And Beauty often in this world gains favor. It does. It's not right, but it is the way that it is. And, we, and we, this is a fact that Christians must accept, wisely teaching our kids uh, what really matters. Okay? And it's going to be inner beauty and refusing to rely too much on beauty for our judgment of people. Verse 16, So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus, into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tibeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Interesting phrase, the king loved Esther more than all the other women. She obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head, made her queen instead of Vashti. And what we see here so far is that Esther's life has been remarkable. Again, remember, she was an orphan. Okay, and so uh, child of Jewish exiles, uh, they both died, uh, raised by her cousin in a foreign and often hostile land. Now she's taken by compulsion uh, into the king's harem, and she found favor with all whom she met, and she was finally selected to be the queen of the realm. So this isn't an accidental course of events. This is by God's design. It isn't luck that's involved here, okay, or good fortune, um, or even about Esther's good looks or sparkling personality. It's part of a plan. Psalm 75, verses 6 through 7 says, For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. And in exactly the same way, you and I have a place in God's plan. We don't always like it, and the prospect of going into a harem sounds fun for nobody, okay? But wherever you are right now, God has a purpose for it. And maybe a short purpose, maybe it's a long one, perhaps large or small, but God has a reason. We struggle with that. And here's why we think that we know I think that I know better than him. Now, we might not say that out loud, or we may not confess that to even the people that we're closest to, but what am I doing when I take control over my life? And I say, Lord, these aren't the people I'm supposed to have in my life, or these aren't the situations I'm supposed to have in the life, or this isn't the pain that I'm supposed to have, have in my life. Who am I complaining about? I'm complaining about God. And, and we are all busted over this. There isn't any one of us that has this perfectly worked out. And so to this point, the story of Esther shows us that in the outworking of his plan, God can use the evil of man. Important to think about that in terms of elections because it's getting insane, okay? That's a nice way of putting it. But let's look, oftentimes in Christian circles, we talk about... Um, uh, we talk about um, sovereignty of God versus the free will of man, right? God did not make a hosserous drunk. Agreed? Okay. 
He didn't make him demand that his queen present herself in an immodest way before the lords of the kingdom. Yet God allowed this wicked action of a man to fulfill a greater purpose in his plan. And so you and I can find assurance in the truth that no other person, no matter how evil they are, can defeat God's plan for our life, no matter what they have done to me or will do to you. That's easy to read. It's easy to type out and save on on Microsoft Word. This is much more difficult to let it settle in the heart and have application. And I have to say that the good news about this is that we are not alone in this. If it was just us solo trying to pull off what I just read, we're done. We have to have other people in doing this. This is not something where somebody just graduates. I don't care if they're the ghost of Chuck Smith incarnated or Mother Teresa or whoever the most godly person you've ever met, everybody has room to grow in this area and it is, my wife put this to me eloquently last night, it's trusting in God. It's having faith that he knows better than what I know. And so in this, what we just read in this section of scripture, it says that he loved Esther. I think lust might be a better word for it. Uh, I think Tina Turner might sing What Does Love Have to Do With It, okay? So I doubt this man knows what love is. I know that's bad. So verse 18, fortunately we have the word of God. Then the king made a great feast, the feast of Esther, so he's smitten, for all his officials and servants, and he proclaimed a holiday in the provinces and gave gifts according to the generosity of a king, It's like, if the king ain't happy, nobody happy. (laughs) He wants everybody to be happy. Everybody's getting Lincoln Logs or Tinker Toys, something. So a feast is a way to perk everybody up. So we're going to see that Mordecai saves the king's life. This is interesting. This is going to be a hard life lesson, okay? Verses 19 through 20, we're going to see Mordecai's rise in prominence, and Esther continues to conceal her Jewish identity. Verse 19. When virgins were gathered together a second time, Mordecai sat within the king's gate. Now Esther had not revealed her family and her people, just as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther obeyed the command of Mordecai as when she was brought up by him. So what's going to happen is Mordecai is going to hear of an assassination attempt on Ahasuerus. He's going to inform the king. He's going to save the king's life. Verse 21. In those days, while Mordecai sat within the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, uh, Bigthan (laughs) and Teresh, uh, it says they're doorkeepers, they're really bodyguards, they became furious and they sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. So in his effort to watch over his cousin, Mordecai overheard an assassination plot against Ahasuerus. I wonder if he even... uh, questioned it at any moment whether or not he should reveal that because I mean we, we're all human you know he might he I don't know nobody knows but we'll find out in heaven but I want to suggest that this is more uh, than a coincidence remember Paul's nephew when we went through the book of Acts hearing of the attempt of a band of Jews to take Paul's life in Acts 23 pretty interesting it's funny because you don't hear anything about Paul's relatives And he just happens to have a nephew who just happens to hear the plot, you know, that saves Paul's life. What a coincidence, or is it God? (laughs) I think it's God. So God had bigger plans for Paul. He spared his life through his nephew. God had big plans for his people. So as we're going to see, he's going to spare their lives through Mordecai, verse 22. So the matter became known to Mordecai, who told Queen Esther, And Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name. And when an inquiry was made into the matter, it was confirmed, and both were hanged on a gallows. And it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. And you want to remember that last line? We were talking about that uh, in our morning uh, prayer and share time before we had a worship team practice. This is weird. Mordecai inevitably saves the king's life. Um, and receives no reward. Now, he does what is right, he does, he does something good, and he receives no reward. How do we feel when that happens? 
I'm not going to translate that. Yeah. Um, this guy's reward isn't going to come for four years. Have you ever been in a place you did the right thing? In your thinking, you went above and beyond what was normal, okay? And then you got nothing, okay? When that happens, no, it will be worth the wait when God repays you. You can get the applause of man that is readily available in our society. It's much better when God does the repayment. It's going to be worth the wait for Mordecai. I'm going to ask Mark and Fred to come up as we get ready to perform a last worship song. But it's going to be worth the wait for Mordecai when God repays him. It will be very yummy for him in chapter 6. We saw this in the life of Joseph. Okay? Talk about somebody who should be a martyr, who should be a victim. It's Joseph of the book of Genesis. He had family dysfunction abounding. He had some crazy dream, and he... <laughs> He really got blasted for sharing that dream, you know? Even his dad was like, what, we're bowing to you now? What are you, little Joe, you know? He gets sold into slavery. He gets wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife. He gets forgotten after interpreting dreams that come to pass until later. <laughs> that was to accentuate the point. Until later. But when he got remembered later... God has him as the second most powerful person in the world. So how we're going to pray is God help us to get to that point. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that only you are able to work all things together for good. Lord God, every time we get together, we're, we got people in this room uh, in different places with you. Lord, I, I, I fear that there may even be somebody here this morning, Lord God, that doesn't know you. If that's the case, Father, we want to pray right now as a family, if you guys will agree with me, Lord God, get them. We pray that your Holy Spirit will awaken them to you. Awaken them not only to their sin, Lord God, and move upon their hearts to repent, but Lord, help them to know that they have got a Father that knows pain, he knows shame, and he is there for you right now this morning. If that's you, I pray that you will accept Jesus Christ right now by faith. Father, for those of us that do know you, Lord God, we're getting ready to go here in a little bit back out into the world. Help us not to be of the world. Lord God, help us to put on the full armor of God. Lord God, help us to be gentle as doves, wise as serpents, Lord God, and just changed by the power of a loving Savior in whose name we pray. Amen.